<laughs> Remind me. Uh, welcome to today's session, and we have quite a special treat in store with Vicky Majewski, who's going to talk to us about the tools of genealogy and what she's found about some of the Baha'is. So we will achieve two things today. One is we will we will learn some more detail on the lives of some of the early Australian Baha'is, but also we'll learn about the tools that she and others are using to uh, uncover these, uh, these aspects of the past. And I came across Vicky's work online uh, and she has been uncovering facts about the early Australian Baha'is that had not re uh, reached us through other means, through our archives and family records. So it's quite a, a skill that she's got and, and quite a gift that she has for our community. Now, Vicky L is originally from Texas, uh, but has lived uh, quite a while now in what's called the Top End in Darwin, Northern Territory. And uh, we're very pleased to have her online. Thank you all for joining today. I'm going to hand over to Vicky, who also will need to unmute. And then the rest of the session, we're in her hands to see what we can learn about using uh, the tools of genealogy to learn about the early Australian Baha'is. So welcome, Vicky. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Graham, first of all, for, um, for convening this uh, wonderful um, Centenary History series online. And thank you all of you for, for coming um, virtually. This is amazing. Technology is amazing. At least that's what I think anyway. <laughs> but um, I'd like to first, I'm going to just pull up my, um, my presentation screen, and this this is kind of this this is mainly to keep me on track, because I will I I do tend to go off onto a tangent. So this is sort of uh, just to make sure that I say everything that I would like to say. Um, so my presentation is about using the tools of genealogy to learn about the first Australian Baha'is, and I'm going to share. Um, some of the things that I have learned, but also some of the um, tips and tricks and, and ideas on how others can get started. Because I, I do these things, but it doesn't have to be all about me. Um, other people can certainly do these things too. And I know that some, some other people have experience with doing genealogy with, with their own families, their own family tree, and doing family history in that sort of thing. But I... Um, I've got a lot of notes here, all the things I want to say. Um, so I'd like to start off, here, here I am, introducing myself. Um, my name is Vicki Freeth Majewski. Freeth is my maiden name. Um, I was born in San Antonio, Texas in 1978, which makes me almost 42. And <laughs> um, in, in the genealogy circles, that makes me one of the youngest people. And in fact, I think I might be one of the youngest presenters in this series, <laughs> if not the youngest. So um, I, I think I, I bring a bit of a, um, a, a different take on things, perhaps. And um, my parents, my, my mother is here, and I, I think my father will join as well. My parents are David and Betsy Freeth. They're both nurses. They both became Baha'is in the early 1970s, and so I grew up in the Baha'i faith. Um, um, one of the questions I always get is, what am I doing in Australia? <laughs> well, um, in 2001, I met a youth by the name of David Freesmith from South Australia, and he was at that time serving Darwin. And he was telling me all about how wonderful it was to um, to serve here and and to and, and all of the great work that they were doing and that they needed people, particularly youth, to come. And at that time, I was a youth, and somehow I got this this feeling that I should be here. I I need to come here for however long that I can. And so um, after I graduated from university, I got my degree in um, business administration and accounting. Immedi almost immediately afterwards, I was on a plane to Australia. <laughs> and um, while I was here, I met the man who would become my husband, and that's Kirk Majewski. And he had become a Baha'i in 2002 or so. He's originally from Sydney. 
he um, he lived in Kings Langley, and he was part of the Blacktown community, and they had, and um, he lived there all his life. And I sort of convinced him after we got married to come here. <laughs> and we've been here ever since, and that was 16 years ago, almost 17 years ago. Uh, we have two children. Um, one is almost 15, he's turning 15 this month, and the other one is 13. So um, yeah, we're, we're a very busy family. Um, I've spent eight years in Darwin, and now I've spent eight years in Palmerston, which is the um, satellite city below Darwin. Um, so, now, genealogy and family history. Now, you notice these um, the pictures I've got. Of, one of them is actually my family tree, part of my family tree, my, my father's side. And the one below that is actually Hyde Dunn's family tree. And... Um, so I, I've been doing genealogy about five years now, um, and it's important to make the distinction between genealogy and family history. Now, genealogy is just, for the purposes of this discussion, genealogy is just ancestry, names, dates. So-and-so was born on this date, married on this date, died on this date, lived here on this date. Um, going back from one person, parents, grandparents, great-grandparents, names and dates. Um, but family history is what really makes genealogy come alive, and it's the stories behind all of those names and dates. What were they doing there? Who did they meet? Who did they know? What jobs did they have? Things like that. Um, and up until recently, very recently, genealogy was a very elite pastime. It was mainly the, the thing of older white men who um, wanted to prove their lineage, particularly for pedigree societies. And later on, it became the domain of ladies. Um, I, I always think about ladies having afternoon tea and talking about their, their pedigree. And that's sort of the the mindset. It, these were the people who were able to get the records, who were able to make the um, to to access the different things that they need to do. Had the time and the means and the education, but now that they're, the computer age has um, come about, it's more accessible to all, and we can use genealogical information and family history information for more than just our own family trees, our own pedigrees, we can use that, you can use it to tell stories about not just our own history, but everyone's history or the history of a place, or in this case of, of a community, of our Baha'i community, our local community, our international community. And, um, and I just wanted to share, um, over the past couple of years, I have done, research on, on some of the early Baha'is, starting with, in, with my parents' community. And this kind of started with my father talking about a, a, a Baha'i pioneer that was buried in, his in, in their community, and his name was Matthew Kassab. Matthew Kassab was not from South Texas. And how he ended up there and where he came from and what he did, we, we managed to uncover all kinds of information. And um, I just wanted, I'm gonna stop sharing this for just a moment because I wanted to share um, the, the book that, uh, that I helped to, um, to do the research on. Um, just share my screen again. Um, here we go. So we worked on this for a couple of years, and this is on Baha'i Library, and anybody could read this. Um, it's the glorious, tra gloriously tragic life of Matthew Kassab. He was one of the first Baha'i pioneers to Nicaragua, and how he came to be there, what he did there, and ultimately how he really gave his life for the 
to, he, and he really, I, I believe he really was a martyr. He, he really, um, it, it's just an amazing story. And we were able to uncover a lot of it through genealogy and through studying his family tree, studying who, who was around him. And um, that's just one of the people I've, I've helped to research. Um, I, we, we've done a couple of others and in, in sort of making, taking shape of, of my parents' community's family history. And now I'm kind of moving on to the Australian community and this is particularly for the um, centenary year. Um, let me just get back on track here. Um, So the, the um, question I usually get is, why, why do this? What does it matter? Who cares? And um, does it really matter where these people came from? The answer is both yes and no. Um, anyone from any background can do great things, can be called to travel, to teach, to inspire an entire national community, as, as we've seen in many different stories. And um, indeed, the early believers were so switched on by the love of Baha'u'llah that they didn't care about, they didn't really talk about their, their families, their lives, what happened to them before they became Baha'is. And in, in my previous example of Matthew Kassab, he never had any contact with his, with his family of birth again that we know of. And however, however, the reason I do this is that primary documentation complements all of these biographies, the letters, and the informal stories that we already have floating around our community. Um, it can either prove or disprove things, and I'll get into more of that later on. Um, family history can shed light on the circumstances that led to finding the Baha'i Faith, and this can be very inspiring to some. Um, the struggles that they may have faced in their lives that and and had overcome that some people really are, can be really inspired by that and and i think that that's another good reason to do this and also it builds and enriches the history of our local national and international communities and so this is sort of a complement to the the other side of this which is the stories which is the um the, the things that we already know in, in our own our own records. So um, before I go any further, I'd like to talk about the scope of my work because there are some limitations. Um, let's see. I, I mainly research adherence of the Baha'i faith living in the West during the 20th and 21st centuries and sometimes the 19th. Um, that's what I know. That's the, um, that, that's what I know now. Now, I'm always learning. And um, I say collateral family members of all, because I really don't have um, the experience to do anything else. But other people might. See, that it doesn't have to be just about me. It could be other people that do this too. And you can use, you can do this from your own experiences, your own knowledge. And um, that would be fantastic. And, um, but it's always a learning process. Um, genealogy, and these stories are not static. They're, um, we're always learning. So the type of genealogy that I do is what's known as collaborative genealogy or crowdsourced genealogy. 
Um, and collaborative genealogy just means sharing information and working together. Instead of doing it by yourself, instead of doing your own tree, your own family, your own work, we share information and we work together. And that can happen online or offline because um, collaboration could be um, interviewing your family members or the family members of the person that you're you're um, looking into. It could be consulting a genealogy society or hiring a genealogist. Um, there are advantages and disadvantages to this, and it it is a bit controversial in certain circles um, because it requires giving up total control of the narrative that um, that you're making. You, in other words. When you make your own story, and you, when you write your own story, you're writing your, your story, your words, your tree, you decide what goes in and what facts go in and what facts stay out. But when you're working with others, they may have a different point of view. They may have information that conflicts with yours. They, and so these disagreements will come up and they must be worked through. And the other major disadvantage is, is that the more people that work on it, the more unintentional mistakes are made. And most mistakes are unintentional, and we have to, um, we sort of have to expect that. And um, collaborative online family trees um, usually aim to build a single world family tree. Um, and participants add and connect family branches together using both traditional research and DNA matching. Um, for the purposes of Baha'i history, DNA matching probably will not be used too much, but definitely traditional research. Um, it, it, it involves connecting people together and, and many people working together and um, putting their their knowledge, everybody's knowledge together. Um, let's see. I, I'd like to talk about one of the um, one of the uh, um, uh, online family trees that I use most often, and that's WikiTree. And I have volunteered with WikiTree for the past five years, and I I was drawn in by some very Baha'i-like ideals in their mission and in their honor code. And as, as stated above, their aim is to build a single world family tree. The assumption is that all of humanity is connected. And in fact, every, they sort of refer to everyone as, as mutual cousins. So I kind of like that. Also, we are required to work together on our shared an ancestors, and we are required to work out our disagreements and consult together. And I, I thought that that was wonderful. And also that we assume all mistakes are unintentional and we must be courteous to each other. And um, that was some of the things, that's one of the reasons that I, I work specifically with Wikitree. And also it's all, all online. Most of it is public. The um, uh, living people are not, but we'll get more into that. Um, I, I I'm trying to think. Um, so that that's where I've put most of my um, my work is on WikiTree. The other, there are two more, um, what I would call collaborative online family trees, and the the, the other one, um, which is one of the biggest ones, is the Family Search Tree, which is run by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints. They have a lot of documentation, have a lot of records, and there are also many Baha'is that work on it too. And that's their website. And also Genie, which I believe is a subsidiary of uh, MyHeritage now, they at one point were trying to build a collaborative tree too. Um, but I don't, I don't really work with this one. I work sometimes with this one, but most, most of my stuff is on Wikitree and that's what I'll be showing um, today. Um, so 
for, now for the centenary of Baha'i Faith in Straya, I focused on adding the family trees of the first nine members of the National Spiritual Assembly of the Baha'is of Australia and New Zealand. And here's their, here's the picture. And um, most of these, most of these folks, and, and I've put some, and, and um, if I've gotten any of them wrong, please let me know. Um, I hope not. But um, most of these folks I've, I've added myself and I, and I feel that the Baha'is really deserve to have a presence on the online tree and it's a good teaching tool too it anybody can come by and see this and and see that their their ancestor if they if they are a, a, a collateral relative of these folks some have no idea what their uh what their these family members have done and i've noticed that too and i'll talk a bit more about that um in a little bit but um most most i added myself um, some were already added by their descendants, and I just sort of fleshed out their stories. And now I'll share some interesting tidbits that I discovered about these folks. So, um, the first one I'll start with is Percy Mead Almond. And um, here's his photo with his wife. So what do we already know about him? We know that he and his wife were the first Baha'is to uh, first people to declare by faith in South Australia. Um, he was the treasurer for the National Spiritual Assembly. And according to his obituary in, in the memoriam section of Baha'i World, he would drive seekers to talks in his, in his reno, which kind of tells me that maybe he had some money. <laughs> so um, I, I did a little bit of research into history. I found some interesting things. Um, he was the youngest of seven children, and to, born to James Almond and Maud Madeline Mead. Um, his father was actually born in London and arrived in Australia as an infant. Um, he worked for the National Bank of Australasia, which I believe is now the NAB, if I'm not mistaken. And he, he worked for several branches in and around Australia, and Percy followed in, in his footsteps. And he was also an accountant and a bank manager. Um, the main thing that, that I thought was fascinating about him was that he served in both the First and Second World Wars. And um, I have, and I'm gonna have to stop sharing here because I have information about him. Well, may, well maybe not, maybe not. Um, because on his page, hang on, I'll just switch over to his page. Um, let me see. Okay. So, let me see. so this is the page I made for him on WikiTree, and there's several different views. And this is I'm logged in. This is my viewpoint, which doesn't look the same um, if you're viewing it publicly. I don't think. But um, I'll show you the family tree view, and I've got some of his grandparents and his parents here. And I, I didn't add that one. I sort of connected him to his grandparents who were already there. But I'll just go back and I'll, um, I'll talk about um, some of the things that, that, that I discovered about him, that he was, um, he enlisted in the Australian Army and served in the 29th Battalion, 12th Reinforcement, attaining the rank of warrant officer. Later, he was attached to the Australian Army Pay Corps. Thought that was very interesting too. And then, um, and then in, during World War II, he was actually um, in what is now the um, Army Reserve until 1948. So that, that's something that probably doesn't 
um, come up, but it, but it, it it sort of speaks to. Um, um, hang on, let me just stop sharing that and go to the next one. Share that one. So let me see. Um, and um, his wife Maisie was quite interesting too, because um, she worked as a teacher, and there are plenty of of articles about her, and her, and some of her her siblings um, working at um, teaching and being a governess in country Victoria in some of the, the newspapers. And I think the next presentation is on Trove, which is where a lot of this comes from. And um, interestingly, she was 15 years older than him, which I did not realize. So that, that, that's quite interesting um, to me, anyway. <laughs> um, I've got the link to the family tree. So um, that's, that was him. Now, next we have Oswald Whitaker. And um, Oswald Whitaker, we, we famously know him as the first person to become Baha'i in Australia. And we know that he was an optometrist, that he had a shop that, um, and, and I've, I've actually put up one of his newspaper announcements, which I thought was great. Um, it showed exactly where his, his uh, his practice was, I guess you could call it, um, has his uh, qualifications in there. Um, I thought that that was, that was very wonderful. And um, some of the things I found out about him, he was the second of two sons born to John Darker Whitaker and his first wife, Sarah Margaret Perry. Now, Oswald Whitaker is what we would commonly know as Australian royalty. And for those who don't know what that is, it means that he is directly descended from someone who was transported as a convict. And that was his grandfather. He was, his grandfather, whose name was also John Whitaker, was originally from Nottingham and was convicted of housebreaking and transported to Australia in about 1835. And unfortunately, his mother died of consumption when he was two. His father remarried and had more children, but they did not survive. And then his brother passed away in 1914. And so it was that that kind of speaks to um, some of the things that he had to deal with growing up. Unfortunately, his father had a very, um, a, a very, shall we say, public divorce with his stepmother. And I think that that must have affected him as well. But um, his father was also a quote, watchmaker, jeweler and engraver and an optometrist. And there are many articles about him traveling around and, um, and testing people's eyes in some of these country towns, which I thought was interesting. And also kind of, it's it, it sort of, um, speaks to what High Dunn was doing as well. And, and the, these guys were all traveling around and that's, we know that that's how they met each other at first. Um, he had, it, there's his wife, he had one daughter and, and he had four grandchildren. Um, there's his family tree, this has a lot more. Um, now the folks that are coming up, Many of them, not all, but many of them um, appear as only as mentions or footnotes in other people's biographies. They aren't real well known in the wider kind community, except maybe by the people who knew them. And some, some may be here. Um, but anyway, we have Silver Jackman. Her maiden name was Hunt, and she's one of two known children born to Frederick George Hunt and Sophia Chambers. And her father was actually from Jersey. He, uh, he came over with his cousin in about 1876. She, has a, she came from a strong Baptist background. Her maternal grandfather was an early pioneer preacher named Moses Chambers. And there are many, many stories about him in the um, 
uh, in the Australian Christian Commonwealth um, publication, which I thought was fantastic. Her name, Silver, likely came from her great grandmother, whose name was Elizabeth Silver, who lived in Hampshire about 1786 to 1817. Um, her husband was um, Leslie, Frack, Frank Jack, uh, Leslie Fred Jackman, excuse me. They, uh, and then they are buried together in Paynham Cemetery. And, and I actually had a photo of that, but I think it's been taken down. So unfortunately I can't show that, but her, her family tree, there's, there's the link to that. Um, Charlotte Moffat was quite interesting. Um, her, her full maiden name was Char Mary Charlotte O'Dowd, and her father, Patrick O'Dowd, was a proprietor of a produce importer called O'Dowd and Company, and it was on King Street Wharf in Sydney, and um, her mother had been married twice before and was independently wealthy. In fact, she had her own house, which there was um, a bit of a tussle over that when she passed away. And that all made the, the headlines. Um, she married William Taylor, Taylor Moffat, and who sadly passed away young. But her twin, her twin sons were born in Italy en route to America, where the family spent several years, which I didn't know. It was very interesting. I think that spoke a lot to her um, experiences. Her twin sons, um, Douglas and Francis, were sent to Gallipoli during World War One, and as far as we know, and this is according to her great-grandson, as far as we know, they are the only Australian twins to have served there at the same time. And, um, and I, I, Family Tree was built with, with help from her great-grandson, who I know that Graham has had some contact with as well. That's um, Guy Moffat, and um, I've spoken to him, and he was quite interested to know all the things that his, uh, his great-grandmother was, was up to. Um, let's just continue on. We have Robert Brown. His middle name was Service, which I thought was amazing. And um, he, was, he was the son of John Brown and Jesse Gray Stewart in Dennistown, um, Glasgow. Um, let's see. I found his war records. His war records show that he served with the Glasgow Highlanders right before enlisting in the AIF. And this was maybe one or two years before. So he must have been there and then immediately got on, got on a boat and went to Australia and then enlisted there too. But sadly, during the war, he was hospitalized twice for what, what is now known as PTSD, but then known as shell shock. And I, that made me kind of sad, and I wonder that how mu how that must have affected him. That must have affected the way that he um, the way that he treated people. And I and I've read his his obituary, which talks about what a kind man that he was. And um, I, I wonder how that must have affected him. Um, he was married. He was married twice. The first marriage. He had three daughters and one son, and when his wife passed away, he married again. Um, he has numerous living descendants, and some of them have added to his tree, which is found here. Um, Hilda. Hilda Brooks. Now, I've had some contact with some of her living descendants who may, may be in the, uh, here today. I'm not sure. But um, the one that, the thing that, fascinated me about her story was more her husband's story. Ewart Gladstone Thomas, he actually spent time in Persia in the years after World War I, and he married his first wife there, and, um, and I thought that that was amazing, and, I, and he, it, it seems clear that he was already a Baha'i when he met her in the 1940s. And um, he was living in Adelaide, and um, he, he operated the trams, if I'm not mistaken. Um, he was a tram driver. And, um, and I, I thought, I, I kind of wondered what that story was about him in, in Persia, what he was doing there, because that's where he married his wife. And, and I found that, um, that marriage certificate. And, 
I did find one of his grandnephews in England who kind of knew nothing about him. He thought that this was just um, another uncle that sort of disappeared, didn't, didn't leave much of a trace in his, uh, in his native town, and I was able to tell him all of the wonderful things that his granduncle had done and that he was a Baha'i and what Baha'i faith was. And um, so I, I, I thought that that was great. And um, most of Hilda's tree was built with the help of one of her distant cousins, whose name is Graham Peters. This is on Wikitree, not, not in our community. But he was quite interested to learn all about her. And he said, oh, yes, that he, he had heard of the Baha'i faith before. He had known someone who was, who was a Baha'i, but he didn't realize that there were people in his family that were Baha'is. And, of course, it wasn't just Hilda. It was her, some of her siblings and her mother. And I, I, I was able to tell him that, and that's wonderful. <laughs> um, I'll just continue on. Um, Margaret Stevenson, now here are the, the New Zealand Baha'is that were on the um, NSA at the time. Um, Margaret Stevenson personally was, was a great story to me because, okay, he, she, she is the second daughter of William Stevenson and Margaret Turnbull. And, um, and I, I actually found her, her birth records, her birth announcement in the newspaper, but what, what was amazing to me was that her father's family came from Dunfermline in Scotland, and that is where my, my mother-in-law is from. She was born there, and her entire family line goes back to that, that village, and I was thinking that, who knows, maybe my husband and she have uh, certainly have um, um, uh, uh, common ancestors. So um, that was personally amazing to me. And there's much more on her page about her. Um, now, Ethel Blundell, who, and, and I know that some, some of you may be more familiar with her brother and her mother and also her niece. And I believe that they are all buried together. But um, I thought that, that her story was, there, there was some story, uh, sorry, there was some, um, interesting things about her ancestry because there is a man named Brian Collette who has done extensive research on the Blundell family going all the way back to the 1400s. And um, it, it goes through the Collettes, the Collette family in London, which appears to have major, um, major ties to that city, major, um, um, I was trying to think, um, but it, but anyway, she uh, the, he's done an amazing amount of research, and I was able to help him when I when I told him about all the the things the the significance that her family had to the Baha'i community, and of course what the Baha'i faith is, and um, and and I'm sure he, uh, he hasn't gotten back to me, but I'm sure he's at least he knows. <laughs> But um, the interesting thing about her mother's family was that her maternal grandfather, Henry Andrews, established the Andrews Brothers Proprietary Limited in Melbourne. And apparently, and, and some of you may know more about this than I do, because this company had, in 1926, I could see that this company had many, dif many offices around Australia. It um, did a roaring trade, a roaring um, import trade. And um, her, her uncle, Charles Andrews, was member for Geelong between 1880 and 1894. And his photo is on the um, parliamentary website, and it talks all about him. So that's interest, an interesting connection there. And her family tree is there. And there are also some interesting descendants that she has. But because they're living people, I won't really go into that at the moment. Um, I'll get into more of that a bit later, but so now I want to get into some advice, some tips and tricks for how to get started if, if you may be interested in doing this kind of research. And 
the first thing I would come up with is ask who to research. And there are prominent early believers, the people, everyone whose name that whose names come up who are in biographies who've had these things written about them versus some of the lesser commu known community members. And um, sometimes in order to um, come up with some inspiration, I'll look through the Baha'i world, the in memoriam pages. There are many, many different stories there that are begging to be told, I think, that you only hear about there. And I, I think that their stories wouldn't come out unless someone talked about them a bit more. Um, so we can, um, the, the next step, I guess, would be to start with what you already know. And um, we, we maybe already have information in your local and national archives, in bulletins, in newsletters. Um, I, I save all of my, my bulletins because I never know when I might need to look something up, but you know, they're, they're out there, they're there. Um, biographies, of course, have lots of information um, or asking questions of the people who've been around a lot longer who may have known these people. Um, and of course, online, there are some really good websites uh, for the computer side of things. BahaiLibrary.com is a wonderful website and I know um, Graham has quite a bit published there and, and others have quite a bit published there too. Um, Baha'i Works is, is a fantastic website and I'll just, um, I'll just pull that up because I want to show you all. Um, let's see. No. Yes, there we go. So this is the Baha'i Works website, and it's also a collaborative website, but it's about digitization of not just titles, but of newsletters and of historical documents. And we're working on the Baha'i world, and, and anyone can volunteer because what happens is the their um, the, the newsletters are read by a computer and transferred in and um, the text is read but it's incomplete it needs a human being to go in there and correct everything and these are the, these are amazing resources for Baha'i history and I'm just going to scroll down most of most of its US publications at the moment but they're working on getting other the publications of other countries they've got all of Star of the West most of Baha'i news, most of world order, and of course, most of the Baha'i worlds. And um, if they always need people to go in and help them out with that, but this is an amazing resource for finding out what was going on, what, what was happening in the communities, what, um, what people were doing, what people were talking about, just to read this stuff. Um, I remember my parents had a lot of these books on their bookshelves. My generation, not so much. We're, I, I don't have a lot of these books, but all of it's online and, it, and, and we can see this and it's wonderful and anyone can access it. And I can't say enough good things about, about these projects. So um, here, I'll just stop sharing that and go back to my presentation. Um, just a sec. So, when, so the, the next step after gathering the information, you may want to build a family tree or you might want to just present it at is, but if you want to go the genealogy route and build a family tree, there are many different ways to do this. On paper, you can use family group sheets and there are many free printable resources out there. Um, libraries usually have them, but also, online even the paid subscription websites have printable family group sheets usually somewhere on their uh, uh, on the website and um, 
and and or you may decide to do it online and for um personally i i would not publish it right away this is um if i'm just building a tree i usually do it do a private tree somewhere somewhere else on my own computer um one of the best ones i know of is family echo free online family tree bu builder totally private put whatever you want in it no one's going to look at it um and of course there are p paid subscription websites if you need if you already have a subscription if you've already built your own family tree somewhere you can just uh, make a new tree for all your Baha'i research. That's what I've done on other subscription websites. Um, then, then the next thing you do is, is research um, in, into um, families. And we have several different types of, of resources. The, um, they're grouped into primary and secondary sources. Secondary, primary sources would be births, deaths, marriages, newspaper articles, electoral rolls, um, things that, that say facts. Um, and secondary- Hey, Vicky, are you, are you um, wanting to reshare your, your screen? Or I'm just not sure whether you're reading off a screen now that you wanted to share, but just checking in. Oh, so uh, am I not sharing my screen? Not at the moment, no. Oh. Um, hum, hum. Okay, I'm not sharing my screen. So I will try to share my screen. Let me just, thank you, thank you for that. <laughs> um, let me see, uh, can you see it now? Yeah, yes. You thanks. see it now? Okay, uh, all right. Yes, I think you've gone to the beginning, have you? Or, uh, go, proceed, it's all, all good, going well. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for that. Okay. Um, so, um, okay. Now, um, um, genealogical resource, research, as far as um, primary sources go, these are um, sources that were created at the time. So, um, uh, births, deaths, marriages, electoral rolls, immigration, things like that. Secondary sources would be um, biographies written about the person, interviews done with people who knew them. Um, those are just some examples of things on the genealogy side of it. Um, after you've done all that, you might want to present it. You, you might want to present it to your community if you've done a, um, a history of a particular community and that can be done as an entire project i've seen that done before you can bind it up and present it to your community or or as i've done publish it online and um that and the way to do that maybe have a blog have a website or put it on a uh, collaborative tree Okay, now I'll go into some tips and, um, tips and tricks that I've, uh, I've come up with for, uh, for doing this kind of work. The first one, number one, document everything. Note where all the information has come from because you may not be able to find it again. And that's happened to me. I'll, I'll, I'll find something and then days later I'll look for it again and it's gone. And the second uh, rule is back it up. Um, I recommend at least three digital or print copies in different places. Um, the second is don't be afraid to venture outside the Baha'i community. Don't be afraid to look at all the resources, to talk to people who may be, um, may, may be related to the people but aren't Baha'is to look at some quote unquote mainstream resources. Um, and um, next, I would say be cautious with information about living people and close relatives of living people. And that's really important. Most of the, um, most of the collaborative online trees that I work with do not share any information about living people. And there are strict rules about not putting anything, even the names of living people are sometimes removed, although that's not always the case. The, the person in question would have to join the, join the community and then 
um, give their permission for that to be up. But it's really important for the sake of privacy um, to, to be cautious with sharing things that you know about the living descendants of this person or that person. And if you approach people who are their descendants, I would suggest getting advice first because a lot of time you can put people off if you approach them in the wrong way. And um, let's see, the next one it would be be mindful of the cultural sensitivities and look out for antiquated language, especially when researching those with indigenous backgrounds and minorities. And um, I came across this myself when I was doing some research on the first people who to become Baha'is in the Northern Territory. In one of the US publications, there was some antiquated language used to describe one of the people that I, I'm sure they didn't mean anything by it. I'm sure that, that it was appropriate at the time, and but now you wouldn't do that. And it, if you quote that, I, I wouldn't even quote it. <laughs> and they also published her photo, which would not be, which really wouldn't be good. Um, so you have to be mindful of those things too. Um, the, next, the next one I'd like to talk about is um, combining traditional in-person research with online research. And there's the saying, in the genealogy communities, there is a saying that not everything is online, and also not everything is in person. There's so much being digitized, and um, that it would be a mistake to only focus on one or only focus on the other, because that's what you're more comfortable with. But it's always good to um, to do both to to expand horizons as much as we can now obviously with the pandemic happening there's only so much we can do and and really i think it's wonderful that so much is is online these days because we wouldn't be able to do this kind of work and and share this kind of work with as many people as we have and it, i i just think technology is amazing <laughs> i'll say that again but uh, anyway, um, look for free resources. There are so many free resources out there. You don't have to, um, you don't have to get a million uh, subscriptions to different websites, although you might have to spend some money. But particularly in Australia, there are so many free resources. And I know that the next presentation, which talks about Trove, which is an amazing, resource for um, newspapers and gazettes and publications all for free and um, what um, the next one is if you come across a paywall don't worry ask for help this is where the collaborative part comes in ask someone most people in our community are happy and willing to look something up if if you can't find something we can help and um, so, uh, and if you don't have that subscription, someone else probably does. So um, don't be afraid to ask. Um, I'll just touch on copyright and permissions um, for the purposes that this is an entire, I could do an entire presentation on just copyright, but for, for the purposes of this, um, downloading pictures and information is usually okay, usually being the operative word, okay. But if you want to publish it elsewhere on your own website or on your own presentation, that's another matter. So we'll always check the copyright and, and if you don't know, err on the side of caution. If you don't know whether it's, it's um, right to uh, share that, don't. And um, the last thing, vital statistics, the, the births, deaths, marriages, usually are not copyrighted. However, if you've got information from someone else, they deserve credit for that. They deserve to be acknowledged in, in your work as um, if, you've, if you found, if you've used, say, someone's biography to, um, to do your own research, they deserve acknowledgement. 
and if you're quoting them, they definitely deserve to be acknowledged. But uh, yeah, that's that's some of the um, some of the mistakes I see others make. But um, and and I make them too. And the uh, and that kind of gets into um, what I'm going to talk about below. But the main thing is to always be open to new theories and new possibilities and learning new things. History is not static. Genealogy is certainly not static. As long as we have descendants, children, grandchildren, it's definitely not static. Um, we might find out something that you thought you knew and then new information comes to light and all of a sudden it, the whole story changes. And I've seen it happen so often where people will think, well, that can't be true because that doesn't agree with what I already know. And it's especially true when you are close to the person, if you knew the person. And then you think you hear something or you, something is uncovered and you immediately dismiss it because you think, no, no, that can't be right. But you gotta be open to new theories. You gotta be open to at least the idea that something is, is um, true and that that there's more to be learned. And finally, and this is a big one, expect the unexpected. Um, sometimes research uncovers long hidden secrets and anyone who does genealogy of their own family knows this, I'm sure. Um, informal stories may not gel with what uh, well, sorry, official records may not gel with what you've heard in uh, informal stories, may not gel with what the person may have said about their own lives. And don't be, if, if you find something like that, and you probably will, don't be afraid of it. Don't be afraid if you find something that doesn't match what is already known about the person, investigate it. And um, who knows, it could be something that, that, um, that changes things for the better, I suppose, changes the narrative for the better. But that leads into controversial stuff, the, which is part and parcel with all of this, these stories. The big question is, once you find something, do you share that? Do you make that public or not? That's a hard question because it depends on what it is <laughs> and, um, and how well you can can explain that, I suppose, because there are things that happened in in ages gone by that would not happen today, or things that that are part of these people's history. They're public. They're out there. Should we share that or make publicize that? That's always the question. It's a question that I've had to grapple with, and I'd like to share a quote. Um, from Abdu'l-Bahá, who reminds us that not everything a man knoweth can be disclosed, nor can everything can, that he did, can disclose be regarded as timely, nor can every timely utterance be considered as suited to the capacity of those who hear it. I always try to remember that whenever I'm, whenever I'm telling these stories. And um, so with that in mind, I'll come to the last and perhaps best known member of the first NSA, John Henry Hyde Dunn. And um, there's his photo. There's, he, um, he was the youngest of 10 known children born to Arthur Dunn and Louisa Jane Knapp. And I, I found his parents' um, wedding announcement. Um, his father was, um, listed as Arthur Dunn Esquire, very interesting. But I love the story of his father. His father was a quote, practical and dispensing chemist, inventor and fancy soap maker. And he had many, many, many advertisements to that effect. And he invented things and he, um, what I thought also was quite interesting about him was that he actually spent time in Mexico during the late 1830s, and I believe one of their children was born there. And that, you know, I, I just, you, you wouldn't think someone would, would be in Mexico for, uh, during that time. What must that have been like for him? And what was he doing there anyway? And 
that that sort of asks the questions. But um, I, I just thought his parents were had amaz an amazing story themselves. But, he, but the thing about this is, is that when and one of the things I uncovered, and I had to check this several times, was that he was married three times, and his first marriage had he had two children in his first marriage. Um, and the story of his children was quite quite interesting. I looked up, I looked them up, I found out what happened to them, and um, the thing is, is that I don't think he ever saw them again. He he and their mother, um, their marriage ended sometime at the turn of the century, and he went off to Canada, and I don't think he ever saw them again. And um, I wonder, you know, and, and Graham and I were sort of talking about that and that he must have, on all of those long trips around Australia, I wonder if he, he thought about them. Um, but that must have weighed on his mind as well. And I understand that he never spoke about his, his life in England or his family in England. And um, he, it, it seems that he came from quite a bit of privilege and he gave all of that up, which is amazing to me. He, he started out as, as a traveling salesman there, and then he just sort of left and gave it up and, and became a Baha'i and spent his entire life teaching the faith and doing everything that he could to bring the faith to Australia, to, to, um, to, to teach. And, and in his work, in his occupation, it, it all of that was left behind, but um, but where he, he came from, all of that, and he gave that up, and and I just I'm just incredibly inspired by by that. Um, the other co coincidental thing was that at least two of his brothers moved to Canada in their adult lives, and some of them lived very close to where Clara was from. Or well, she wasn't really from Canada, but she grew up there, and the same part of Canada. He, two of his brothers were living there too, which is incredible. This is an incredible coincidence. And there is so much more about him on his page. And um, I, I, I encourage everyone to read it because I, there's more I could talk about here, but I don't think I really have the time. Um, let me just continue on to what's next. What, so what, my, um, what's next for me is I would like to start a, an official Baha'i project on Wikitree. Right now it's mostly just me doing the things that I am doing and I'll just show you and I'll unshare my screen again. Um, let me see. Oops, stop share. Okay, that works. Um, I'll just show you all the work that we have done so far. And no, I think I clicked the share button this time. So I'll just go back. This is the Baha'i Faith category on Wikitree. I've I built this um, a year or so ago, and I and I put most of this in, and there are a few subcategories. Um, this will always change. There, as more and more, more and more people are are tagged with Baha'i faith, more and more people will show up. And in here, these these are the people I've added so far, but not just me, but many of the people I've worked on. I want to expand this, and I want to have a. Um, I want to make it a real project to put more of the biographical information and the lives of the early Baha'is on on collaborative genealogy sites like Wikitree. And now I'll go back to my presentation. Um, There it is. Vicky? Yes. Just, um, I, I know you're aware of the time, so just doing a time check. We've got 20 minutes left. Uh, okay. 
And just to let you know that, and I know there will be a lot of interested uh, queries for you. I'm almost done. I've just, uh, um, I've just uh, the last few slides are just resources. So um, I'll, I'll um, let's see, am I sharing? I'm sharing, okay. So my, uh, I'll just quickly go through this. The, um, uh, the other thing uh, that I've started on is uh, working with the history of the Baha'i faith of the Northern Territory. And right now, most of what we've got is in the, um, is only in memoirs. And I want to go through those and pair them up with what's in the records and get a more clear picture of our, our community's history. I think that that's very important for us all to know. Um, and of course, research is always ongoing. I'm always learning. I always want to learn more and more. I'm certainly no expert on this. I know other people know more things and I want to work with other people to learn more and more, always. Um, and so I, I've put up a list of resources, mainly the ones that I use, and I'm very happy to share these um, um, afterwards or via message or whatever. Um, I'll just continue through these. These are just um, notes. And finally, thanks everyone. Thanks for your time. I just want to um, acknowledge, oh, um, I just want to acknowledge Graham, thank you so much for, um, for this series, for putting this together. I want to thank my parents for always supporting me. They've, they've um, have gotten subscriptions for me. They've looked things up when I wasn't able to, and they also listen to all of my rambling about all the things that I found. I really appreciate that. Thanks, mom and dad. Um, thanks to my husband for putting up with me too. <laughs> This, this this sort of thing isn't isn't um, interesting to a lot of people, but hopefully it's interesting to someone. Um, and thanks uh, thanks to for um, every everyone that I've asked questions to that has taken the time to answer them. So I, I really 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 appreciate all of you sharing your knowledge, and I look forward to um, hearing more from you as well. So thank you very much. And now I'll turn it over to any questions that anyone yes. might have. Yes, thank you. So that's truly inspiring. And uh, you do have a community of interest here. People are interested in your work and you've, in, you, you've enthused us. You've, in, you've, you've educated us. Uh, we have so much to learn about this aspect of, of discovering our, our past, whether it's our family history or our Baha'i history. I'm going to hand it over now to people who have queries. We know uh, that uh, the, probably the best way is to uh, maybe in indicate something in the chat area uh, or indicate that you have a question for Vicky and we have uh, roughly 15 minutes uh, remaining in this session. Please go ahead Ahmed. Um, in, in her story I heard that they use DNA testing and found out that the whole of mankind comes from a female and male, which looks very interesting to be similar to have Adam and Eve. They're the new man, and they've been past human beings, but the new um, modern man comes from one uh, family. And I was just wondering whether DNA testing would have any um, kind of uh, a, a play in uh, uh, finding uh, the history of Baha'i faith all over the world. Hi. Um, uh, uh, genetic genealogy is, it's an entire subject in and of itself. And unfortunately, most of what I know, um, there, there's several different types. Um, the one that we usually um, work with um there i'm trying to think there's there's um it only goes back maybe to it accurately goes back about 200 years now you can do mitochondrial testing and you can do y dna testing and that'll take much further but that's absolutely true is that humanity we really 
we really have all been traced back to a single common ancestor. And for the purposes of doing family history, however, um, it's we we could if we um, if it, if it, say if it was my family and I wanted to confirm that so that I'm related to this person or that person, I might test myself, and then I test another see if my test matches another known descendant. And if that's true, then we know that we have a common ancestor that 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 person probably is related to. And, and as far as um, the high history goes, I haven't encountered it much. But then again, I don't have, um, I, I'm a second generation Baha'i. I don't have very much history in my own family line. So other people might, and other people could probably do that. And that would be wonderful. But it's definitely another area that, that is, uh, that, that one could look in. So thanks very much for that. Yeah, thanks for that question. I, I just have another um, uh, is comment it, is to it, make. Is it Can on I, her presentation, Ahmed? Yeah, yeah. The, um, uh, thank on, you for on that. what she's presented to us. Yeah, thank you for that presentation. And I think it would be nice to ask the National Assembly to allow these kind of presentations to be put on campus so that Baha'is can access them rather than being on a third party um, place. Mm. Okay, thank you for that. Are there any other uh, queries for Vicky about her work? Uh, Graham, Ovid here, I do have a question. Hey, please go ahead, Ovid. Um, Vicky, first of all, thank you for your presentation, but also thank you for all your research. Uh, the piece on Wikitree on Mother and Father Dunn in particular is uh, absolutely amazing. Um, you mentioned before about uh, Father Dunn, um, that he didn't have contact with his children again. I noticed from your research that his son did go to Canada to spend time with um, Hyde Dunn's uh, brother. Um, Hyde Dunn, it, it would seem from Graham's research and your research, he wrote to many people. Is there any evidence that he kept in touch with his siblings by mail, having so many? Um, as far as I know that um, when he first came there, the evidence is sketchy, but it looks like he went to Canada first. And um, I think that he did have some contact with them, at least for a while. I don't think that that kept up, though. I don't think that he maintained contact. Thank you. Well, thanks, uh, Beta. If you can ask, and then I'll, and then Olya. Thank you, Graham, and thank you, Vicky. I just wanted to just briefly comment on how beautiful your presentation was and how inspiring and, and how the labor of love that's gone into it. It's, it's really exciting and wonderful. So thank you for your time and um, the joy you have taken in doing what you did was clear right through and very apparent and it excites us all to take on this kind of um, um, work as well. And also the resources you shared at the end was very valuable and useful. So thank you so much for that. I don't have a question. I just wanted to thank you and thank Graham for <laughs> providing this platform. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Olya, please, did you have a question? Um, question and also I would like to appreciate that. Um, thank you, Vicky. Really proud of you. Wonderful presentation, especially colleges. And learn that a lot of things around you to go through the background of our family. I can't believe that 10 years, beautiful girl, 10 years old girl, 30 years ago I meet, but now <laughs> my body of all <laughs> Now it's time to grow, to find this opportunity, meet you and with your wonderful mom. I want to just say thank you, thank you, Geron. Fantastic job. 
you have really wonderful because this is uh, all we learn that something we never think or attention. Uh, make a wonderful talk, not only colleges, you are full of energy, positive and wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. That really means a lot coming from you. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Graham, I have a question. Yes, Sila, please go ahead. What about the early Aboriginal believers? Can you trace their ancestry? Um, kind of thing. Um, maybe. The, the answer is, I don't know until I try. So it, I, and I, I'm only, I suppose I could say I'm only just beginning at the moment. So um, if, if, if I, um, if I give it a go, I'll see what comes up. Sometimes, sometimes nothing does. And sometimes I get a lot. And sometimes I just don't have the expertise to do it, but maybe somebody else does. Maybe someone else who's more familiar with records in other places and records in other languages can help out with that. Because I, I want this to not just be me. I want it to, to other people who are interested in doing this kind of thing to um, maybe give it a go. Can, can we get a sense of whether Vicky's presentation is inspiring anybody to look at the background of the first believers in their own communities. Who would like to talk about that and efforts they made or efforts they think they might make now? Can I just say that um, Mojan Moomen has written a book, or oh, um, Graham, I think you're talking, but you'll speak. Yeah, you're yeah, very quick. You got in. I, I was just going to just check with Mos, Moshe and Chris whether you were clapping or whether you wanted to say something. I, I was going to say uh, that Mojan Moomen has written a book called The Baha'i Communities of Iran uh, that has got genealogy of some of the early Baha'is in there, in, in, in English. Um, so there are works there, but I, I'm sure in future there will be great works coming. That's great. Thanks, Amit. Now, Moshda, you there? Chris, what's your, what's your comment? Um, it's a bit noisy here. I hope it's not too noisy. Yes, I just wanted, I was, I'm very much inspired and I have, basically my inspiration was from the start, from the first session that you started, Graham, about, you know, the first, uh, the Baha'i faith here in Australia. I have got a, a great grandfather who is really Indian and met Abdul Baha. I don't know much about him, so I really want to find out more and um, yeah, I'm going to look back at this recording and maybe get in touch with Vicky and yourself, Graham, and you know, uh, get some help how to go about um, this journey of finding out more about him. He actually met Abdul Baha, as I said, and from the little knowledge that I have that he was, Abdul Baha bestowed his name upon him. Yeah, and uh, yeah, and even like things that like, because I, I, you know, I, so I am sort of uh, I'm Persian, but quarter Indian, three quarter Persian, one quarter Indian. But I'm, I have never been to Iran and I don't really know much about, you know, that sort of uh, my ancestors in Iran as well. So that's another thing, um, how to find out. I, you know, um, yeah. it's interesting. It, it's good not only for me, but for the next generation, you know, the ones that are beside on outside of the Middle East and they don't know nothing about, you know, where, they, where we come from and things like that. My husband is African, so it's nice. I want to record about how his father became Baha'i. So his father was the first one who became Baha'i. And things like that, it's, it's really wonderful um, to actually record them. But yeah, sorry, that's all I wanted to say. I'm very much inspired. I can see that there are resources out there that I can make use of and support. Thank you. Thank you very much. 
Uh, thank you, Moshe. That's great. And uh, I think we'll, we'll check in uh, again later with Vicky uh, when some of us have some results. Uh, June, please speak. Yeah, I, I think it would be really beautiful. I've been reading the um, autobiography, biography co-written of Kevin Locke and about his story of how he discovered the Baha'i faith and his history and, you know, what interested him and just beautiful, beautiful stories. And I think it would be really lovely to have a collection of all, like just the diversity of the ways that people have um, found out about the faith in their families, like, like what um, Moshe was talking about, like almost like your origin story is a really beautiful thing to, to know. Um, and so, yeah, I just, and I really enjoyed it, Vicky. While Vicky was talking, I actually went online and did some research on one of the resources. I got really excited because I found a reference to some World Congress tapes. And I was like, oh, cool, this, this works. Maybe I've got more leads. So yeah, thank you, Vicky. Your enthusiasm is very infectious. And I think also be really lovely to just encourage, you know, that that collectivity of anything that promotes that idea of the oneness of humanity, that we do have Papua New Guinea and we have a lot of Pacifica Baha'is living in Australia as well. And there's so many diverse stories that we could be telling. Thank you, June. Colin Breast, are you there uh, with a hand up? Yes, go ahead, please. And unmute, unmute yourself. You're still muted, so just got to unmute you. Whether you can do that. Colin, can you do that? Wait, Colin, you're, you're muted still, so. Yeah, can you hear me? Go ahead. Um, I encourage people to get involved in their local family history groups. Um, when I was working with the archives doing that, I thought, I'm going to try and focus somewhere you know, within the community, you know, other than just a highs, because I say we need to widen our, you know, our vision, not just stick to become insulated just by highs only. So I joined the family history group anyway. And they, well, they they network all over Australia and even around the world, but um. I managed to get selected as the secretary, <laughs> but it's really a worthwhile cause. Uh, Colin, thank you for that. Uh, yes, I, I'm, I'm into that as well. And uh, you can look up the Hassel Family History Association. We've got over 20,000 relatives in Australia. Oh and boy. hundred of them in the association. That's about Thomas Hassel being a busy man, wasn't he? Uh, Ro Roland Hassel, Roland oh. Hassel. Thomas's father, and we've been in Australia since uh, 1798, I think it is. Uh, so anyway, so th th that's an in interesting point to, to look at our own larger family histories. Uh, now, we're mm -hmm. going to have a few minutes, um, and uh, thanks for those comments on the side. Arvid's your comments, uh, appreciated. Yvonne's uh, comments. Uh, inspiring the Persian friends to see how this can be done uh, for, for, for Persian families. And what are the challenges there of online resources or sharing of this? Uh, because what Vicky's presentation has pointed out is that although the focus is Australia, but it's the roots out into um, communities worldwide and societies and cultures worldwide. And that's what we're discovering through this type of work. So we're not just interested in what happens in Australia, but the links uh, in our global family. And she's really emphasized that with the homework she's done. Uh, Yvonne, I just wonder whether we can uh, make that link with the presentation next week. I remind everybody we're back to 7.30 for next week uh, and Yvonne will talk about Trove um, and whether, uh, Yvonne, you want to do an advertisement for that um, because Vicky did uh, refer to it. Uh, tonight we will finish in a minute or two because uh, we have a feast tonight and most friends will be wanting to have some dinner and then a feast. So we will finish promptly. Uh, but I just see if, if Vicky's got any last thoughts or comments and uh, whether uh, Yvonne's going to accept my invitation to just say something. I think you are. Over to you, Yvonne. I'm not sure. Let's see. Uh, Yvonne, whether you've got a microphone there, you're, you're unmuted. Never mind. 
we'll hear from you next week. <laughs> so Vicky, any last uh, uh, comments from you before we finish for this evening? I could do a whole nother presentation on this. There's so much. Your and offer just, is accepted. Your offer is accepted. Okay, so we'll slot you in. I, I just <laughs> wanted to say thank you to everyone for coming. And, and there's always so much to learn. But but if you've got stories, if you've got um, stories in your own family, write them down. Please write them down, whatever you remember. And start with that. Start with what you already know, because following generations can use this. And even if that's all you got, we, you can use that as a stepping stone to build a real history. And of course, the next generations can make that part of their history too. So please, please, please write, write all your stories down because I love them all. They're amazing. Thank you. Thank you, Vicky. Hi, I, just to, want to, I just want to mention that, Vicky, it would be possible to make a documentary presentation of these um, you know, informations so that it could become like a video presentation that can be sent to TVs, radios, or things like that to publicize the Baha'i faith that way. Yeah, absolutely. That, that's something we could look, we could work towards for sure. Yvonne. Oh, we can't hear you. We can't hear you. I'm just not sure whether you're plugged in properly. No, there's no sound. I'm so sorry. Anyway, we'll check that for next week. So friends, thank you so much. Uh, uh, I will